What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village. In the last episode, we met a mysterious person. Um, well, actually, Luke and Layton meet a mysterious young girl at the dead end on the north side of the village. She starts to tell them something, but a sinister figure lurking in the shadows scares her off. Yeah, I'm, I'm betting on that being Flora. <laughs> Afterward, a puzzled Layton and Luke find a ticket to the town amusement park and head there. And in route, um... We headed... Oh, wow. So those are hidden down there, even. We headed into the sewers. And now we're outside the sewer? Ah, uh, so this would probably wrap around... To the point of getting the, uh... What's it called? Of getting to the park. Can we get a puzzle related to the car from over here? I certainly didn't foresee sewers leading to a place like this. Look, Luke, there's my automobile. Oh. It is a puzzle. I was actually, I thought he was going to say the usual, like, it's too bad the, the car couldn't come across the bridge, but no, it's actually a puzzle. All right. Um, you and your girlfriend went on a road trip over the weekend. On the way to your destination, you drove 180 miles, and your girlfriend drove the rest of the way. Okay. Coming home on the exact same road, your girlfriend drove the first 150 miles, and then you got behind the wheel for the last leg of the journey. So what is the difference in miles between the distance you drove and the distance your girlfriend drove? Interesting. So... Hmm. What is the difference in miles between the distance you drove and the distance your girlfriend drove? So there's some total distance, right? And we don't actually know what that is, right? Um, so if we have like a total distance, let's say T. And that's equal to... 180 plus however many miles the girlfriend drove on the first road, which we'll call G1. And then the total is also equal to 150 plus the amount the, the boyfriend drove. We'll call that B. We can just call it G and B, actually. We don't need to use subscripts. So what they're asking then is... What is... Oh, okay, so so G is, in this case, the specific, uh, like, sub-distance <laughs> for each of them. But the total, we'll, we'll call it, like, capital G, is equal to, for the girlfriend's driving distance, is equal to what? It's equal to lowercase g plus 150. And we'll say bigger, like, uppercase B is equal to... I also realize I probably can't draw on this, can I? No, I can. Okay. That's nice. Um, well, I guess then, for those of you that are wondering, uh, you're maybe drawing this in your heads. We're writing it down as I say, but capital B is equal to lowercase b plus 180, right? Right. Okay, and so what we're looking for is the difference between the two. So, if we're looking for essentially either G, we're looking for the absolute value of G minus B, capital G minus capital B. So what is that going to be equal to? That's going to be equal to lowercase g plus 150. Um, actually, I should probably do it the other way just for the sake of the, the signs and everything, but minus lowercase b in all in parentheses um, plus 180, which when you simplify is equal to G minus lowercase b minus 30. So that's our distance. So what we are looking for is then can we use our original two equations, our first two equations that relate the, the individual driving distances to the total distance to come up with an expression for G minus b. And I think that's the key to this. If we take our first two equations, um, let me see if I can write this down here. So t is equal to, so you guys can actually follow along for those of you that care, <laughs> um, is equal to 180 plus G, and then T is also equal to 150 plus lowercase b. Now, if we subtract these two equations, we can actually get an interesting expression. We get 0 is equal to 30 plus G minus b, right? 
we get zero is equal to, again, we're just subtracting the, the bottom equation from the top equation. So zero is equal to 30 plus G minus B. All right. And again, um, we're looking for an expression for G minus B. We're not necessarily solving for G and B. So then G minus B, if we add or subtract 30 on both sides, actually, G minus B is then equal to negative 30. All right. And then putting that in just real terms, that means that the boyfriend drove in his question mark section 30 more miles than the girlfriend did in her question mark section. So G minus B is equal to negative 30. Now again, I'm going to clear this. What we said earlier, what we were just doing, is we said that capital G minus capital B, again, absolute value because we're talking about a difference, is what we're looking for. And we said that that was equal to, um, we said that that was equal to lowercase g plus 150 minus b plus 180. And again, capital G and capital B represent the total distance driven by those individuals, girlfriend and boyfriend. And then when you simplify this, you get that it's equal to G minus B minus 30. And again, um, this is all in absolute value, so we don't have to really worry about signs to some degree. And we just solved using our two previous equations with the total distance that G minus B is equal to negative 30. Meaning, if we plug that in here, that this big difference is actually equal to 60. Because G minus B is negative 30, subtract 30, we have negative 60. But again, we're dealing with a difference um, in distance. So it's absolute value and that negative 60 becomes a positive 60. So the difference in miles will actually be 60. This is a really interesting thing because it feels like you need to know what the total distance is to and from the place, but you actually don't. So let's hope after doing all of that, <laughs> I'm correct. So we'll say 60 miles. I think I've got it. All right. We got it. Saves the day. That's uh, that's some pretty roundabout algebra. Um, requires a little bit of uh, creativity in how you set up your equations. But yeah, as shown in the above chart, your girlfriend drove a total of one way minus thirty miles. You drove a total of one way minus or one way plus thirty miles. <laughs> gotcha. So again, they said the in that case, one way is equal to t. Bang up a job, Luke. Huh. That's a, that's an interesting phrase. We got a fossil. We'll give it to Luke for now. That's fine by me. And then, do we want to continue on that way? Honestly, I don't really want to. I want to head back this way and check the sewers in the other direction first because I feel like they're not where we're supposed to go. <laughs> Naturally. Um, are there any hidden puzzles in the cracks, in the bricks, in the water, by the water pouring down the gates, anything? No? Okay. And let's see who you are. Sylvain, or Sylvan. Ho oh, there! Now what can I do you fellows for? You're the park caretaker, are you not? Would you mind opening up the gate to the park for us? Well, how could I refuse two curious lads such as yourselves? Well, I'd like to open it up for you, but I've got to finish this repair job here before I do anything. Is there anything we can do to help, then? Kind of speed things up, you know? <laughs> Funny you should mention that. If I could just figure out the area on this map, I'd be done in a jiff. You any good with things like that? Oh, am I good with things like that? <laughs> so, squares and circles. Oh, I like these types of problems. This should be fun. Sylvan brought you this diagram to see if you can help him with it. Several circles and squares are pictured in the diagram below. How many times larger is the area of the blue square, so that's the far outside square, 
when compared to that of the red square. Okay. At first glance, it's probably like one-fourth, admittedly. Um, or So it's like four times bigger, or three times bigger, or something similar in that magnitude. Can I draw on something, or write on something? Let's grab a nice piece of paper here. So, the first thing we're going to want to do is say that... Um, Oh, so the, yeah, this is pretty interesting. So with this big square, right? It has a circle circumscribed within it, of course. Um, the radius of that circle, or rather the diameter of that circle, is going to be equal to the side length of that square. So what we're going to do is call that first diameter of that circle. Actually, no, there's not an easy way to get around. We're going to have to deal with some fractions. All right, we're going to call the radius of that first circle. No, we'll just call the side square. Um, we'll call the side length of the blue square S. All right. We'll call that S. Or I could work this the other way. No, we'll, we'll just do it this way. So the side length of the blue out, outer square is S. That's the diameter of the circle that's circumscribed within it. So the radius of that circle is actually S over 2. Now you'll notice that there is a square within that circle. And if we were to take the radius of our circle and connect it to the corner of that square, we're then able to create, essentially with the diameter, the diameter of the circle is the diagonal of the inscribed square. And because we have all the side lengths of a square are equal. Um, we actually have a an isosceles triangle and specifically a 45-45-90 triangle. Meaning that the diameter of this circle, or rather, yeah, there's a ratio of the, the diagonal of this square to one of the side lengths of that square is gonna be the square, a ratio of square root of two to one. So, I mean, I've just gotta keep track of which circle and which square we're at, really. Um, so S over two was the radius. So the diagonal is equal to S. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's the diameter of the circle. So the diagonal of the first square coming from the outside after the first circle is S which means the side length of that square is actually gonna be S over the square root of two. We're not gonna rationalize that denominator for now because that would just complicate things. <laughs> so the side length of that square is S over the square root of two, which is going to be the diameter of the circles inscribed within. You see the, the process here, right? So the diameter of the circle within is S over the square root of two meaning the radius is s over 2 root 2. Or rather, we don't even need to do that. Which means the, the diagonal of the inscribed square, which I believe is the square we're looking for, the diagonal length is s over square root of 2. Which means the side length of that inner square is going to be s over square root of 2, again, divided by square root of 2. Which, when you have square root of 2 squared, um, that cancels out the radical, so we have s over 2. So s over 2 is the side length of the inner square. And again, I'm just making sure we've done that for the correct number of circles and squares, because it's kind of uh, confusing to keep track of, all right, now we're on this circle, now we're on this square, now we're back on this circle, now we're on this square. Um, but again, there should be two circles, and I think we've worked with two different circles now and three squares in total. So yeah, our side length of the inner square is going to be s over 2, meaning the area, which is side length squared, is going to be s squared over 4. And then our big squares area is going to be s squared. So the big area, the outer blue square, is four times bigger than the inner red square. All right. I feel pretty good about that. That was also my initial kind of intuitive 
uh, hunch about answer. how the ratios would work. All right. Every puzzle has an answer. Every puzzle has an answer. That was pretty cool. Um, I like these types of I I like geometry problems uh, that that relate. Um, I guess like circumscribed squares and uh, you know <laughs> circles inscribed within squares, etc. Um, relating side lengths to radii. I, I tutor actually high school math um, and specifically for the ACT. And those are some of the most fun ones I, I like to get to teach because a lot, very few people, not very few people, I can't really say. It's not a very intuitive way to look at it. <laughs> but regardless, I hope that was somewhat insightful as to how to go about that. Fine work, the both of you. Soon as I, soon as I take care of this busted main, I'll open that gate for you. Great. Thanks for doing that. There, that ought to take care of this mess. Now let's open up the park, eh? And we got a painting scrap, so we're only, I think, two away. So this is pretty exciting. Just hold on one second here. Oh boy. So we've opened up the park finally. There we are, the park is yours to explore now. Professor, we're in. Thank you, you've been of great help, caretaker. Ha <laughs> ha I hardly need thinking, sir. After all, this is my job. Way back when, I used to keep it open every day, but these villagers, they don't care a whit for me park. I'm glad you fellows stopped by. It's the first time in a while I've had to do me job. Interesting, the villagers don't care. The villagers don't care. So, because I didn't fully explore everything to my liking, um, we are going to go back in the sewers. And head over uh, to the left. Um, it's kind of annoying that we can't really click on any of the on-screen icons when Robopupper has shown up, but that's okay. I want to head back out over here. Is there anything else we can click on, or any other puzzles to find, or whatever it may be while we're out here? We found ourselves a hint coin. A second hint coin. Is there something in the water, maybe? We already checked out our car, and I think we can't go any place further. Interesting. Okay, I thought that we would actually... Um, go around the outside of town that way to get to the park, but it seems not. Let's head back over by where we chatted with Sylvan and see if there's anywhere else we can go. I didn't see if there was any extra area or whatever it may be. Found ourselves a hint coin, and again, no no hidden puzzles? Really? I'm surprised. But, okay, if that's the case, I will accept... I will accept that there are no more puzzles there and head on up. Kind of crazy, we've completed 98 puzzles now. 98! And, uh, into the park we go! Whole new environment. This park is really kind of sad, isn't it? It's all rusty and abandoned. It's just as Sylvan said, it seems that no one's set foot in this park for a dreadfully long time. I feel like it's going to relate to the fact that the villagers are robots, and they don't really care for nature. Now, on to business. Let's give the grounds around the ferris wheel a once-over. I expect we'll find something of interest there. Okay, um, so naturally there's a map here that's gonna lead to a puzzle. Oh my! What is it, Professor? Look at this poster. The picture appears to be the same as the one on the ticket we picked up. It looks like it's been posted here for ages. It's so faded, you can't even read the letters. Yeah, no kidding. Oh! Hey, isn't that... It kind of looks like the same girl. Yes, I thought so. That's little Flora there in the middle of the picture, isn't it? She looks exactly as she does in the portrait we saw of her in Reinhold Manor. It would seem that Baron Reinhold built this amusement park for the sole enjoyment of his daughter. Wow. Strange. I wonder why it wasn't more popular with the village folk when it was open to the public. It is strange. Well, I don't suppose speculation will help us very much. <laughs> Let's keep moving. Right you are, Professor. Add it to the mysteries list? No? Oh, I guess not. Map of the park. Um, trash can. Find a nice hint coin. Lovely. Anything else of interest? I'm surprised that didn't turn out to be a, uh, a puzzle. Well, at first glance, we can go to the right or we can go forward. Looking at the map on the top screen, it... I mean, either way we go, we'll end up at the Ferris wheel. Let's go this way. This place is so run down, it looks like it hasn't been touched in years. What a shame. I bet it used to be a fun place. There's even a big tent like the kind you see in circuses. 
Yes, there is some something quite sad about it, isn't there? How strange. This was clearly a traveling carnival, so why was it left to rot here in St. Mystere? I bet the Ferris wheel is a mess too. I suppose I wouldn't won't get to use that ride ticket we picked up. Well, we have better things to do than ride that thing, don't we? Not to mention, after having not been used for so long, I don't know if it would be the best, uh, most safe option. Somewhere in this park hides a clue to finding the golden apple, I'm sure of it. Then hunt for it we shall. Oh, there's a hint coin? Not a puzzle? It appears that no one is working the shop. Well, yeah, no kidding. And there are no puzzles at the shop, or what? The circus big top, no one seems to be inside. Really? Really? Nothing? I'm shocked that it wasn't a puzzle. Something hidden up in the trees, maybe? No? Okay. Well, before we head to the Ferris wheel, I'm gonna go back and around this way. See what's on this side. We've got our friend here, and then it looks like another page on the ground. Look at this, Professor. It was lying on the ground. It appears to be a scrap of note paper. Would you read it aloud for me? Sure thing, Professor. Alright, let's see. The older she gets, the more young Miss is catching on to this village's secret. The older she gets, the more young Miss is catching on. Ah, young Miss must be Flora. She seems lonely, which is probably why the boss asked me to build an amusement park for her. Yep, it certainly looks like I've got my work cut out for me. The young Miss mentioned here must be Flora. The whole park was built just for her. And again, I'm pretty sure the villagers are all robots. Wow, this is gonna be crazy! This is gonna be nuts! I'm pretty sure the villagers are robots. But I don't understand this other line. What's all this business about, business about a secret in the village? I just wasn't ready to handle the boss's death. Poor young miss. She's all alone in the world now. But no matter what happens, I have to keep going and take care of her in the boss's place. Huh. How do you do that? The page ends there. Baron Reinhold sounds like he truly loved his daughter more than anything. Fate can be so cruel. Interesting. Alright, Sylvan, what you got for us? Oh, you lads again, eh? How do you like me park? Lovely, isn't it? The sun's shining bright today, and I'm in fine spirits. Why not celebrate this weather with a puzzle? Let me tell you one of my favorites, or one of me favorites. <laughs> Number 88, in a hole. Okay. A tennis ball has rolled its way down into a hole. This particular hole is extremely deep and has a sharp bend in the middle, making the ball impossible to retrieve by hand. To make matters worse, the ground around the hole is made of hard clay, so digging the ball out isn't an option. However, you have something incredibly commonplace on hand that you can use to get the ball out. What do you use to get the ball out? Answer in five letters. Oh, it's water. <laughs> um, you just pour water in there and it should float to the top, theoretically. And if you're out there playing sports, I'm sure you have water. I'm fairly confident with this one. Um, the only thing that's going to be difficult is uh, inputting it <laughs> in the uh, the touch screen. So let's let's give it a go. This is pretty classic, where it's like I've played this in you know horror games, where there's something you can't reach, so you pour water into whatever is carrying that thing or contains that thing, so it floats to the top. I feel pretty good about this one. Luke, here's my answer. All right, we got it. Another puzzle solved. 3,140. As close to pie as we'll get. <laughs> That's correct. Theoretically, you could use any liquid in which tennis balls can float, but water is the liquid you would most likely have handy. Since the ground is hard clay, there's little chance of the water getting absorbed in the surrounding earth. The ball should come up with little difficulty. That's pretty cool. You're quite the solver, aren't you? Ah, uh, yes. Getting back to me, Park. It hasn't been properly maintained, and parts are just rotting away. If something looks old and broken, do the smart thing, lads, and stay away from it. Yeah, that's a good idea. The violin, we're gonna give that to Layton. It's also been a minute since we've looked at their furniture and everything. Let's let's take a look and make sure everybody has, well, what they're what they want. So, um, the violin. I wonder if an old thing like that still sounds good. What does Luke have to say? Wow, perfect. I'm learning the violin back at home. Alright. <laughs> there, there you have it. Um, we also have a fossil. Oh, an ammonite. It's all swirly on the outside. What a find. It makes one reflect upon this planet's long history. How does their happiness change? Doesn't. Um, I guess I'll leave it with uh, Luke for now, then? <laughs> I don't know. What's interesting is that the items aren't added in the order, like... I guess they occupy space. 
uh, or they take up spaces or tiles that you wouldn't expect. Like the pile of books is all the way down here now, for some reason. You have the wall clock. I don't know. Um, neither of them is fully happy. I could try and like mess around and see how things change as we add or detract them from different rooms. But maybe it's not as... Maybe it's more minuscule and then there's, you know, one moment where it all jumps up. I don't know. For the time being, just going by uh, what they say. But neither of them is too ecstatic about their rooms, it seems. Let's look at this painting. We are really close, right? We're only two scraps away. Let's take a look at what we can do. So I can rotate these, can't I? I can. It looks like there is a window. Um, with maybe some curtains. Maybe that's the intent here. I mean, the corners are always going to be the most important part. They're only, they're only four corners. So let's, let's go back. Oh, that's not exactly what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to sit down and work with the puzzle a little bit. Um, let's add all of the corners. Okay, so now we'll switch again, and then we'll add this. Oh, I need to place it, at least temporarily. Okay. So, those are the four corners. I'm admittedly still not seeing much. Hmm. You know, what's interesting is that uh, this piece here seems to have a reflection of the window. Or maybe it's like covering up the window or something? Like that? Like part of the window is behind it, maybe? I don't know. It's really tough to tell, admittedly. But this piece here looks like it definitely has part of the, the window or the scene or whatever it may be in it. This actually, oh, you know what, this fits like this. So those go together. Nice. <laughs> We're making progress. So let's look if there are any more painting scraps that specifically address the night sky. Um... Oh, you know what? That painting scrap in the lower left corner of the top screen, that looks like Lady Dahlia. Or Violet, potentially. Which is certainly interesting. Hmm... Are there any pieces that look like extensions of the curtains? looks like this piece might be, right? If I were to kind of turn this like that, I could probably place it here, and it... Mm, does that fit? I don't think so. It's close, though. <laughs> it's definitely close. But maybe not quite close enough. And then one of these, it looks like the curtains will end in the lower left corner. Yeah, that definitely works. And so what, what's also really cool is that it shows that the window extends really low um, throughout the entirety of the scene, which actually makes me think that this foggy description, or this foggy part might be in the lower right. But no, the way the, the bottom of the window is angled, it makes me think that this will actually need to be in the top right. And then this would by default be over there. And that seems to be fitting with the with how the how angular the floor appears to be. Okay, um let's add another piece. I think that some of the window pieces might be helpful. So something like this would probably go down a bit lower. Would it fit like that? No, it would not. Um, again, 
we're probably going to want to rotate it like this. Because that will fit the lighting better. And that actually fits appropriately. Wonderful. Let's switch back and add ourselves another piece. Let's go with this one. Is this a border on the right side of the window, maybe? Something like that? Or is it on the underside? Hmm, actually, that one might be that one might be tough to place, admittedly. Let's try this piece. Oh, this is the piece that goes here. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> um, okay, and that also sets up another window piece. So if we rotate this this way, we should be good. We can place that there. We're doing pretty well. We also have this new emergence of a, like a white, I don't know, couch or, or something um, that is going to fit in here. And again, it's gonna border this bottom half. And it's not here, and it's not there, so it's probably actually right there, if I had to guess. Um, let's add another piece that has the, uh, the white figure in it. Is it gonna go here? It's gonna go right there. Is that Claudia, maybe? The white ball of fluff? Is that Claudia? So this looks like it's gonna go um, on the bottom here. Yeah, that's definitely Claudia. Okay, and then it's gonna be Violet probably looking out uh, through the window. So let's add Claudia's face. Not Claudia. Um, what's her name? Uh, Violet, probably. She's all the way up there. This... I actually have an idea for where it's gonna go now, because I didn't realize how high up in the picture uh, Violet would be. We'll put that there. We can start to go back again. And again, because now we have this long column in the center, we have an idea of where we can put this. That goes up there. All right, we have two more border pieces, and I think that's um, all that we really have space for on that side of the frame, so we'll add that. Um, I should have actually just grabbed the other border piece, but what we're going to do is rotate? No, actually, I think that was in the right orientation, was it? Mm, that doesn't look quite right. I'm gonna put that over there for now. Oh wait, no, don't displace that piece. Okay, I didn't know that was gonna, how it was gonna work. <laughs> um, all right, let's 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 bring this piece here. We can move this one out of the way, and then we'll move this here. We can rotate it like that, and ooh, the picture is coming together. Where does this go? It looks like it goes like that. Yeah, so we're just missing two more scraps, but we are really close, guys. We are really close, and that's really starting to come together. It's very cool. Okay, now let's look around for some more puzzles. <laughs> oh, now I'm really excited to see what the what the scraps do. Anyways, we found ourselves a hidden puzzle. The largest total, 116. Okay, 50 picarets. Nine squares are carved into a piece of wood. Arrange nine unique numbers between one and 51. Huh, so that any three numbers have the same sum when added vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. Oh, so a magic square, right? That's actually, that's pretty cool. While several combinations are possible, your task is to find the number that occupies the center square when you arrange the numbers to yield the highest possible total. Wait, what? Your task is to find the number that occupies the center square when you arrange the numbers to yield the highest possible total. Total, total what? As in like, hmm. Range nine unique numbers between one and 51 so that any three numbers have the same sum. Okay, I got that. 
Well, several combinations are possible. Your task is to find the number that occupies the center square. When you arrange the numbers, is that when they say total, does that mean the the number that is the sum of the horizontal, vertical, and you know, like like the designated magic magic number? Hmm. This seems like a pretty big problem. Nine unique numbers between one and fifty-one. That's a lot of numbers to work with. <laughs> and I feel like that's the tough part. Hmm. So how would we want to do this? Well, let's take a look at the highest numbers we have to work with. I think, I think they are being inclusive. They don't mean between in a very literal sense. They mean from 1 through 51. I think. So they want us to include 1 and 51 as potential answers. I think. <laughs> I hope. Um, so if we were to take, let's say, like the three largest numbers, right? 51, 50, and 49. That adds up to 150. Obviously, anything else would not be able to add up to that. But could we get other pairs of numbers that add up to 150? Probably not. Definitely not. Any set of numbers fewer than that would be lower. So how far low can we drop? Hmm. How do we approach this? I feel like we first need to figure out what the total number is that we're trying to sum things to. I usually only deal with like magic numbers when dealing like when doing Sudoku or something like that. <laughs> so it's usually like three by three and just dealing with the, the digits one through nine. Not the numbers one through 51. And it's for the highest possible total. So I'd imagine it may be the numbers like 51 through 43 or something. Could you arrange them in such a way? Could you kind of... Basically, you need to choose a set of nine numbers, and then you have some sort of middle number um, that you pair numbers around to, to add up to a certain sum. So, for example, um, if I wanted to do a magical square with the sum of 15, I would choose, would it be five or six? Six um, in the center. And that way I have or no, five. Yes, I have five in the center so that I have um, one, two, three, four pairs of numbers that add up to 10 around me. Hmm. So, all right, well, well let's see here. So if we have the numbers 43 through 51, Right, that's that's nine numbers. Um, the fifth number would be 47. So if we were to take something like 47 in the center, let's let's draw that. 47 in the center. Um, on looking on both sides, right? Let me let me write this out. So we got 43, 44, 45, 46, 47. 48, 49, 50, 51. Again, the, the middle number there, the middle of the nine numbers is 47. So we'd have pairs on both sides that would add up to what? Well, they would always add up to 47 times three, which is 141. So I think that might be our total that we're adding up to. And so we'd have to pair numbers in rows and columns and diagonals, like 46, 48, 45, uh, 49, 
44, 50, and then 43, 51. And I think that would work. The thing is, it would also need to work for all of the other rows and, and columns, etc. And the way it works, um, in the corners, these corner spots up here, that I circled but really shouldn't have, um, they're involved in three different sums, totals, diagonals, etc. Whereas the like the cardinal direction slots, these guys, are not. So given the number we're totaling to is 141, which is an odd number, we need to have one odd number added to two even numbers for all the different sums. Because two odd numbers add up to an even number. Which means that the even numbers need to be in the corners. So we could have something like, all right, let's clear this real quick. We could have 47 and then we would have like 46 and 48. And then the other even pair would be 44 and 50. And uh, I guess we'll have to choose how we arrange that, but um, we do something like this, 44 and 50. Now again, we've chosen 141 as our total based on the pairs and everything. So now we'll need to choose where our odd pairs go. Um, and we have starting off with 45 and 49. We're probably gonna need 49 here, although that's not gonna add up, is it? It's not. Um, so 49 and 45, where do they go? 49 is gonna go here. I believe, yes. And then 45 will go here because I'm just kind of looking at the singles digit to make sure that it adds up to a one. Um, and so you'll notice in the bottom row, there's the four, nine, and eight, which will give us a one in the singles digit. And then we have zero, five, and six. And then the other pair is 43 and 51. So we'll put 43 in here because we have the zero, eight, and three to get that one. And then this on the far left will be 50. Fifty, not fifty. <laughs> Fifty-one. I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. Oh wait, it's supposed to be fifty-one. That's poorly drawn. But I think that's the magic square. Because, and again, we did that by saying, what's the highest set of nine digits we can use within this number system, within this set of numbers they provide us? Because so long as we have nine, we have a middle number that we have four pairs of sums around it, um, that will add up to, I guess, the, like, triple that middle number. So I think 47 is actually the, the case here. This is all, of course, assuming they're including 51. <laughs> if they're not including 51, we need to rework it, um, which would be a little bit annoying, but I'm pretty sure the number would then just be 46. We wouldn't probably go through the entire math of actually writing it out the entirety of the uh, the square. That was a really bad four. Um, so we said 47. Yeah, let's do that. How does this sound? That's not it? Oh, I was sure I had it. Okay, um, well, if that's the case, I'm pretty sure it'll be 46. Um, it's just dependent on whether or not they're inclusive of the 40, of the 51. And, um, and again, we would just kind of shift everything one over. So 50 would be the highest number. We'd be dealing with the numbers 42 through 50, and then 46 is your middle number. Then you have you know, the, the pairs of 45, 47, 44, 48, 43, 49, and then 42, 50. So you could do it again, um, but 46 would be the center. And I won't write out what the whole thing is, but 
I think that's what they're aiming for. And I should have I should have just trusted the wording that they give and that they say between and that they I understand the implications of that word. That's not it. I've let you down, Professor. Hmm. I feel like I was fairly confident in this one. Am I misunderstanding something? There are nine unique numbers between 1 and 51, so that any three numbers have the same sum when added vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. I, I chose the sets of numbers such that they would be the same. And I accounted for if they say through 51 or really mean between 51, meaning the highest number that we could choose would be 50 versus 51. Um... I mean... Is there something I'm missing? Those, those look like they work to me. But I can't imagine it working for any number bigger than 47 because you don't have that pairing, like I mentioned. The idea, so find the number that occupies the center when you arrange the numbers to yield the highest possible total. And it seems like that total refers to the sum of any particular row, column, or diagonal. And I'm fairly confident I, I chose the highest number that would make that work. We're not choosing, oh, let the center number be the highest number possible and then make it work. It's find the highest possible total, and then find out what the center number would have to be for that. And I feel like... having the total be 141, which would be 47 at the center, or, um... Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I mean, again, if they really mean between, then that center number would be 46, and the total would be 138. And really, the highest possible total you could even think of, like imaginable, would be 50 times 3, 150. But you couldn't sustain that. Because you don't have numbers higher than 50 to work with. Um, to sum things up correctly. Am I just misunderstanding what they're looking for, or...? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to use some of the hints now, because I feel like I had a pretty firm grasp on what needed to be done to make that magic square. And I don't think it's possible with any number higher because you lose out of, you know, you, you need to have four pairs of both even and odd numbers that sum to the same sum on both sides of your center number. And that necessitates that you have at least four digits between your center number and the maximum number of your set of numbers you can choose from. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a hint and see what they want to say. There are 51 numbers you can choose from. Okay, so that confirms that they mean through and not between. But since you're trying to get the largest total possible, you might want to try the bigger numbers first. I mean, yeah. So they're including uh, 51 here. So it should be 47. What are the other hints? You should place large numbers. Use the numbers 43 through 51 when formulating your answer. That's that's literally the first thing I did. <laughs> that's literally the first thing I did. 
might not seem obvious at first, but the center number is used in every single tabulation. Since you're trying to get the largest sums possible, doesn't it make sense to put the largest number right in the middle? Can you do that? Can you do that and still have it be a magic square? Oh, I'm... S <laughs> wow. Yeah, you could. Um, you just have four pairs of numbers that are all less than it but you can maintain that it's the same sum. So yeah, it's 51. Wow, um, because then, yeah, you could just arrange the pairs of like 43, or yeah, 43 and, uh, well, no, if the number is 51, if the number is 51, we could then pair what? What's our total gonna be, right? We would add 50 and 43, we'd get 93. We add that to 51, we get 144. That would be our total. And that total would actually be higher than 141. Yeah, so you would make a pair with 50 and 43, and then 44 and 49, and then 45 and 48, 46 and 47. Maybe? I mean, this makes sense. Why Why was I so bent on having the center number be, I guess, the center of the matching pairs surrounding it? Maybe that's just from Sudoku or something? <laughs> I don't know why. Because, yeah, you just need four pairs that add up to the same sum that you can then add to the center number. So yeah, it's gonna be 51. Well, at the very least, the hints uh, clarified that they're including 51, which means between is actually not the correct word. But now we know. Well, here's my guess. I did it, yes! I should have known that they would uh, not make it that crazy difficult, but magic squares are cool. Um, and the total is 144. Yeah, I don't know why I was so... so fixated on the center number being between the pairs. Like, as if in each pair that was being added, there needed to be one less than and one greater than the center. Because when looking at it, I mean, it, they just need to add to the same sum for four different pairs. Regardless of whether or not one number is less than or greater than that center number. Huh. Oof. I got it, but just barely. The largest tool was added to your puzzle box. Okay, we got Robo Pupper showing us where some of these uh, hint coins might be. Although I think we're pretty set on hint coins. We've solved a hundred puzzles, and there, you know, I don't know how many puzzles there are going to be. Maybe like 150 actually in the in the game. We're just waiting for that final boss gauntlet of difficult puzzles or something. And yeah, I don't know. Um, some really cool puzzles in in this episode. I really like a lot of the math. I'm glad I got to talk about magic squares and come up with one, even if it wasn't the one the game wanted me to come up with. And in the next episode, we'll head forward to the Ferris wheel. Although, actually, no, there's, it looks like there's one attraction along the way. So in the next episode, we'll check out what that last attraction is and then the Ferris wheel and hopefully get one step closer to uncovering all the mysteries of the park, the village itself, everybody's robots, <laughs> and, uh, and I hope you guys are looking forward to it just as much as I am. But until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.